Okay, so today is our second day amongst the Permian synapses. We're out of the Carboniferous fully, talking about our mammal line amnio relatives. So not that thing that's yelling, that's a pariasaur, one of those para-reptiles you guys met last week, one of these Permian reptiles. But the things chasing it are certainly our cousins. These are therapsid things. So synapsid, remember, is the side of amniota that's everything closer to mammals. The first kind of paraphyletic radiation of synapsids you guys met were the pelicosaurs with the sails on their back. Pelicosaurs are paraphyletic relative to therapsida. You are a therapsid. Therapsida is a monophyletic clade. Those two saber tooth guys up there are animals called Gorgonopsians. They're some of the biggest celebrities amongst the therapsids. Uh, one of the first evolutions of like a saber tooth predator morphotype uh, in the fossil record, which is really cool. Mammals have special teeth. The rhapsids are related to mammals. A lot of the mammal special teeth features, there's a many, many, many of them, show up in therapsida. And you guys are gonna see that therapsids do a lot of experimenting with teeth. So they get things that are mammal-like, but really not exactly the same as what mammals have. And so many times on the mammal family tree, especially as we go into like more recent tens of millions of years, you guys are gonna see repeated evolutions of that saber tooth morphology. This one back in the Permian, way before there's like, you know, any dinosaurs or anything, is the first time we know about that these big saber-toothed predators evolve on mammal relatives, which is really cool. So we'll get into them today. Just to remind you where we are. Here we are in the middle of synapsida. So you guys have already met A through F. Those are the pelicosaur grade the synapsids. So pelicosaurs, like I said, show up in the Carboniferous, they're the earliest synapsids. And most of them, almost all of them, are gone at the end of the early Permian, which is a good chunk of the Permian. That's almost 30 million years long. There's a long time on Earth history when you go back in your time machine, you're gonna see pelicosaurs everywhere. But by the time we get to the middle Permian, we're kind of into these animals that are called therapsids, and that's who we're going to meet today. And again, this is a monophyletic clade, therapsida. So at the end of class last week, I showed you guys this. I asked you to make some observations with your neighbors. A lot of you very astutely noticed, that at least on the slide, which is a little cartoon that I made, there's like a big temporal jump between these clades of pelicosaurs and those clades of therapsids. They almost don't overlap at all. I will tell you that there are single species, single genera that we know right here that help us understand therapsid origins. But the reason we probably don't see therapsids showing up in a, like a stepwise way is probably because of the fossil record. We don't have good high latitude fossils when you're in the early part of the Permian. That's just like a oops, earth feature. And then when you get to the middle and late Permian, we don't really have good tropical fossils. And that's where a lot of these pelicosaurs were. So it's a real big problem. We talk about it all the time. For therapsida, which is, like I said, monophyletic, and you yourself are a therapsid. You are in that arrow on the far right that says Cynodontia. I gave you guys four characters. Hopefully you can remember what they are. I won't go over them all again right now. But that's where we left off on Thursday before that long three-day weekend. So this is what I left you with. Actually, I'll have, instead of me blabbing, I'll have you read that because it's a good thing to like internalize before we jump in. So there's a lot of really amazing biodiversity and evolutionary experimentation you can think of it as within therapsida. And so we're going to spend some time in that today with like a little bit of a nudge towards things that are showing us more and more mammally features. <laughs> All right, here's that first clade. You can see right there, Biarmasuchians are the sister to the rest of the therapsida. So Biarmasuchians are your therapsids that are like, you know, this isn't how you should think about evolution, but like closest to the pelicosaurs, right? They're sister to all the other therapsids. So rather than me blab for a second, I'll let you guys talk to each other. You haven't seen each other in a few days. Make some observations about these early therapsids, these beer masukians. Yeah. 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 Non-nerds <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not, 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 not
All right, what are some things we're picking up on? We were noting the um, eyes are appear smaller relative um, to the You mean like in the paleo art? Because I think that's probably a little bit silly. Like they got pretty huge, okay. pretty huge orbits. I mean, that's the skull right there, the real skull. What the eye ring set in there. Yeah. Like a distinct sort of uh, arch, the eyebrow arch. Yeah. So these animals are really interesting. So some of them have quite big eyeballs. Uh, a lot of them are like people try to do their best to measure those sclerotic rings, the little bony ring. A lot of reptiles today still have a ring of bones set into their eyeball. That's not a weird thing to have. A lot of amniotes have that. Um, and so people try to use those sclerotic ring measurements to get an idea of like diurnality versus nocturnality. Are some of these animals more nocturnal animals, which is really interesting. There's sort of interesting evidence that some Vermisugians are nocturnal, which is kind of cool. Uh, so they certainly have kind of big eyes. Um, they're very, like, think about the uh, pelicosaurs you saw last week that looked like big lizard guys. Very long, thin limbs, very gracile is the word a lot of morphologists would use, like meaning thin and delicate looking. Kind of long arms, long legs, and the body plan is a little more upright, remember? Two of the thoracic characters were uh, uh, the humeral head and the femoral head. Different pieces of the femur and the humerus helping the animals to be more of an upright stance. So this is probably a quicker animal, a more limber animal, which is very interesting. Uh, definitely all predators, as far as we can tell. This paleo art's pretty unpleasant. <laughs> uh, none, nobody I know who works on therapsids, and I dabble, uh, thinks these guys have hair. Hair hasn't shown up yet by these guys. But these animals are really poorly known, and so there's not a lot of paleo art of them. I like this piece of art because it shows you the cranial diversity. We do know these animals have lots of crests and bumps and knobs all over their head. There's one clade within Biermasuchia that's all ornamented like this. And so you can see how very different their ornamentations are. What's that all about? Can't tell you, but it's really interesting. A lot of therapsids play around with cranial morphology, bosses and ridges and little horns and protuberances. Uh, what were they covered with in life? Were they covered with like keratin? Were they just skin, scaly? Really interesting questions to wonder about because again, I am gonna be a pretty strong contender that these guys shouldn't have any fur on them in this drawing. Um, that's like a choice some people make when they make the art. But this is like a nice drawing of one of the real skulls. You can see above the eye, there's like almost like super orbital horns, these things above the eyeball, which is really cool. Really interesting animals, uh, very enigmatic, and certainly going to be the animals that help us understand the pelicus or therapsid transition or animals that are Biermasukian like. I just want you guys to look at these because they're weird and nobody ever talks about them. The next clade up the tree is relatively short lived. As far as we can tell, it's pretty much only existing in the middle part of the Permian. There might be a teeny bit of the range that goes up into the late Permian, but a really short lived lineage. And so the end of the middle Permian has one of those most recently recognized mass extinction events at the end of the middle Permian. And these animals, dinocephalians, which means terrible heads, dinocephalian is terrible head are uh, one of these animal lineages that shows up in the Middle Permian and seems to go extinct at the end of the Middle Permian. Uh, there's a lot, I hope you can tell, of interesting things we could talk about <laughs> with these animals. This is outrageous. Uh, there are two big clades within Dinocephalia. I'm not giving you the names of those two clades. One of them becomes these really, really uh, large bodied herbivores, a lot of Middle Permian ecosystems on land. It's Dinocephalian predators. And again, we're thinking as always in this part of the tree, the default condition for common ancestors is like carnivory. So eating meat or eating other animals one way or another. The other family uh, is one of the first evolutions on the synapsid side of herbivory. You guys met adaphosaurs and caseosaurs already, pelicosaurs that play with herbivory. T uh, these animals, which are called tapinocephalids, they also do it. So I'm gonna stop talking for one second. Maybe I'll put this up. That's the skull of this animal. There's the real thing. You don't believe the picture. Uh -huh. uh, and then this is one of the predators chasing down one of those poor priosaurs yet again. They're always getting chased by somebody. Um, but go ahead and talk to your neighbors for a second. Make some observations about these guys. The predators on the left, the herbivores on the right. This one is actually probably one of the herbivores, even though it looks unpleasant. <laughs> 
Go through that Ulemasaurus fall. I think you'd enjoy that. Yeah. yeah. That is that is all right tell me something about the ulemosaurus that skull on the upper right like what's jumping out to you because that's a real skull too and i love that specimen yes yeah, it's not, not often you see that with really big horns and also big phoenix i know isn't it gnarly <laughs> Stemonosuchus is like one of the best um, in terms of like an animal that makes you feel like. <laughs> yeah, what's up with ornamentation? Ornamentation today like this, this kind of ornamentation is almost always sexual display. So something amazing is happening here. Um, what soft tissues are covering this? Like this artist has these ends exposed, you know, as like a little horn and then these are fully exposed, but is that what it would have been? I don't know. We do have a bit of we do have a bit of like actual skin off of one of those horns. Yeah, that's so, true. Like so, so like you know down the yard, the skin goes part of part of the way up the horn, and the end is covered by. Uh, You're talking about the, this one, right? Yeah, that's actually supported by what we found on it. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. What about the lemosaurus? What are you noticing? I hope. <laughs> Underbite. An underbite for sure, we could say. That might be just how the fossil's set. What else about the face besides maybe an underbite? Angled down, weird way. Angled down, angled down for sure. Yep. And then huge teeth is what I was hoping you'd all know. This <laughs> is like, right? Really gnarly teeth. That thing also has a dome on its head. So, uh, moss chops, the animal that's in the cartoon right there, that's another genus of Tapanocephalus. Moss chops is very often, aside from Dimetrodon, the only other like the Rhapsody thing that you find in like a dinosaur play kit. Like if you get a set of dinosaurs, there might be this like weird thing. That's usually my chops. And they have these big bony heads, inflated skulls that are really thick. I have been there when we have dug up fossils of animals like this. And sometimes the skull is almost nine inches thick of just bone. So are they head butting? Head butting is interesting. Fighting, why are they fighting? Some of them obviously are trying to look sexy. Some of them have these giant full swollen heads. So interesting, like sexual selection probably going on in this group of like, you guys might tell me what you think. Some people think these are rather unpleasant looking animals and they're humongous. So, okay, interesting. Some interesting adaptations. I wanna show you a little more about the teeth. So this is from a fossil expedition I was on. This is one of those dinosaurian teeth, a tapanocephala is what it's called, we'll call them dinosaurian teeth, the plant eaters. One of those incisor-like teeth found in the field. So you can see how big that tooth is. That's one tooth in a hand. So these are really big teeth. And what's cool about them is that on one side, they have like a pointy bit. And on the other side, there's like a heel or a basin that is on the back side of the tooth. And so when that animal closes its mouth, those teeth fit together in a certain way. We say they occlude, they can process vegetation. They're probably nipping vegetation. They're probably not doing a lot of chewing because those teeth are way up in the front of the mouth, but they're able to really efficiently probably rip up vegetation from the ground or from the plant that the vegetation is on, which is really interesting. So these are incisor form teeth and they're interlocking. I want to point out that even the predators have in the front of their mouth, this style of tooth, but then very blady teeth in the rest of their mouth. And of course, those big canine looking teeth. So like very, very, very cool animals, very weird animals. Uh, they do not live for very long, so we won't spend too much time on them, but I just think they're really fun. The next clade of uh, therapsids you were going to meet, so you met the Biermasukians, and then we met the Dinosaurians. are these animals, the Gorgonopsians. Uh, Gorgonopsians are the bomb. <laughs> they are some of my favorite animals. So the rocks that I usually do my paleontology field work in are Permian and Triassic. And so the basins I go to in Africa, places like Zambia, and then colleagues who work in South Africa, Tanzania, these are the big predators we find in those ecosystems. Um, I'm gonna do another lap around the room. Why don't you guys talk about Gorgons as they're colloquially called for a second, Gorgonopsians.
We can't really know that very well. Certainly, the big one. I mean, but I think you're saying where. Yeah, yeah. Very front. Where you say we won't go on or very very easy. Sure, that's weird. All right, what are we noticing about Gorgons? Yeah, good. Big guys about the large lateral temporal fetish. Yeah, look at that, right? Good for really, really strong jobs. There, where? Doesn't matter. But yeah, those big holes in the back of the skull for where the jaw muscles attach onto. And look, you can kind of use your brain to like, like trace down from like behind that bar, which is this in you, right? That cheekbone. You can trace where that jaw muscle will go in onto those big parts of the lower jaw. Which is really awesome. So these are very strong jawed animals for sure. What other things? It looks like it's a really strong neck. Strong neck. Okay, interesting. Certainly, they have a lot of really interesting adaptations to their neck. I'm not really showing you those details, but like when you find a gorgon loose vertebra, you know it's a gorgon. They have a lot of like hollow spaces in their vertebrae. There's a lot of places for muscles to attach, which is interesting. Not hollow like inside. I'm sorry. I mean, just like excavated, like very deep fossa uh, depressions on their vertebrae, which is really cool. So strong necks and all that. Um, Obviously, these guys are the ones I showed you in the first slide. They're saber-tooth predators. So the saber-tooth ecology is really interesting. Probably when you guys think of saber-tooth, you are thinking of cats that have saber-teeth. <laughs> Those are the most famous saber-tooth animals. And cats are mammals, true mammals like you are. And so a cat only has a baby set and an adult set of teeth. And so we can look at fossils of animals like the saber-tooth cats that we'll meet way later in this class. And they kill with their sabers but almost certainly they're not like violently jumping on animals and ripping them to shreds. Because if they break their saber, which is very long and relatively thin, they don't get another saber. And so there's evidence in the fossil record of those saber tooth cats breaking their sabers, like that happens, but it's not very common. And so almost certainly animals like saber tooth cats are like bringing down their prey. You guys ever watch like a nature video of a lion catching a wildebeest or something? They bring it down and then they suffocate it. They bite its throat or they bite its nose and they suffocate it out. That's what lions usually do. And so saber-tooth cats, we think, do that with big animals. And then maybe when the animal's very exhausted, they use their sabers to like do something terrible, right? These animals, gorgons, sabers you might imagine for the animal to create are very expensive relative to their other teeth. But what's really cool is we have plenty of fossils of gorgons and they do replace their sabers. Like they can grow another set of sabers. So there's plenty of fossils we have where you can see the replacement saber coming in. And so they can probably be a little more interesting with how they use it. They're not as constrained as mammals are. Those teeth aren't occluding as precisely as mammal teeth. Another fact that some of you might find kind of fun, uh, it's in a medical journal, which makes me really happy. A friend of mine was cutting open jaws of Gorgonopsians to talk about how they attach their teeth to their jaw, the tissues involved, how mammalian is the dentition, and totally by accident, an undergrad found it when they were doing the like grinding of the slides. They can look through the slides under the light and see through the bony tissues. 
The earliest evidence of a mammalian odontoma, a tooth cancer, is from a gorgon that had like a tooth replacement go wrong and there's like a bunch of little teeth in its jaw. And it's exactly like the kind of tumors you see today, like in a veterinary setting, but it's in this Permian fossil, which is really cool. So these, people, these animals are uh, obviously living successfully, doing their own things. Look, at this is a prehistoric again. Don't they always just get <laughs> brutalized? Uh, very interesting, very interesting animals, really, really cool. They get so big. Uh, this is a colleague of mine, and there he is in Tanzania with a fossil we found, and you can see, I hope, what that fossil is. Uh, that's one of the sabers, but what I want you guys to know, look at this skull, please. The one he's holding is the lower jaw saber. <laughs> So that fossil is in Seattle right now. That fossil is routinely one of the ones that, like on a tour, you get to be like, and all these people who study T-Rex or study whatever they do are like, oh, whoa, what? Because that is so big. That's like a head like this. It's not nice. <laughs> really fun. I think these animals are spectacular. Um, so not only do they have these sabers that are like long blade-like teeth, very thin teeth, but there's serrations on those teeth, like a steak knife. And so there's structures, there there's a skull, there's a zoom in on some incisors, a zoom in on a canine like tooth, so canine form tooth, size of form like tooth. You can see the little serrations there on the back side of the saber. If you go in really close, you can see the dentine structure of the tooth, and then you can see the waves in the enamel of the tooth. And what's really cool is saber tooth cats today, they have serrations on their canines too, on a saber tooth cat's saber, but those serrations are 100% the enamel. If you cut a saber tooth cat's tooth, the dentin is flat and the enamel goes like this. In these animals, the dentin and the enamel are dimpled. So it's obviously an experimentation with doing serrations. What's really cool is if you cut a dinosaur tooth, like a T-Rex tooth, it is exactly well, histologically 100% pretty much identical to what Gorgon did do it. So this animal has sabers, those sabers have serrations, but the serrations are kind of a reptilian y dinosaur -y style, not at all what saber tooth cats do and how they make those steak neck serrations. So, again, levels of homology here, levels of analogy, which is really interesting. Something I wondered if you guys would notice, because I heard it last week, some of these really big gorgons have no teeth past their sabers, no chewing teeth at all, which is kind of disturbing, maybe. And so what's really fun is there are certain specimens. This is a beautiful specimen from Tanzania. Uh, this one, when they prepared the fossil out, there's like a whole half of another therapsid like in its guts. So these animals are certainly killers and then just like, like a seagull, if you ever watch a seagull eat a rabbit, like <laughs> if you want to Google that, that's a really good example. A seagull eating a rabbit might sound awful, but like all they do is grab it and go, and the rabbit just disappears. <laughs> So these animals are probably doing that kind of thing. And so here's some really wonderful paleo art from a mammal paleo artist who wants to talk about cat and talk about saber teeth. But this is an illustration from one of his books on the first saber tooths, which are gorgons. And so there's a very unfortunate animal in three pieces <laughs> being consumed by a couple different species of gorgons uh, in the Permian of South Africa. These animals are great, uh, obviously. I'm a big fan. OK, uh, just for fun, because I can't resist, and this is my class. Uh, this is a specimen I found in 2019. I was beyond excited when I found it. I knew it was bone. Uh, I wanted to know what it was before I told anybody because I had an idea. And I had to walk around it, walk around it, walk around it. And then finally, I was like, oh, my God, because I realized what I was looking at. I want you guys, please, look at this. Talk to your neighbors. Make some observations. Would you, this is how you find it in the field. What do you see? You can chat for a while. No idea. Where is the harder? We're expecting to probably save some. Okay. Oh, you think so? <laughs> oh, yeah, really? Oh. Well, if that's the order, then you can do two. 
All right, so obviously, obviously, I spoiled it for a lot of you by trying to change the screen right now. But what are we seeing? What do you observe at all? You don't have to interpret it, but like, how about just like color pattern, you know, monkey brain style? Like, what do you even notice? Do you see a leaf? Do you see a rock? Because <laughs> those are in the picture too. Do you feel like you see something that might be bone? Yeah, there's like a bone texture. A bone texture. This white part here, especially, this is a broken off piece that was right there. Right there also, right here, you can see this brown rock and then like a little bit of a curve. That's broken bone. That's eroded bone. And so you can see like within that rock, there's like obviously something curving, which is really exciting and interesting. That's part of what I could see when I first found it. And then where it's dirty right there, that's me like brushing away the debris that's on the surface to see what else was visible without having to dig in. Did everybody have it spoiled by that picture? Because <laughs> I was walking around, I'm like, I know I got bone, I know I got bone, I know I recognize what I'm gonna call pachyostosis, the bossing, the texturing that usually these therapsids have on their skull. So I was like, okay, 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 it's a therapsid skull. Who is it? And I'm walking around it. And that hole in the middle, finally when this part clicked for me, I swear it was like an out-of-body experience. I was like, <laughs> because I realized that that was the eyeball looking up out of the ground. So this thing's been in the ground for 255 million years. And here's the eyeball just barely on the surface looking out. And so I freaked out and I was so excited because I realized who it was, it's a Gorgon. And I went to go get my backpack, which I had set down like 20 yards away. And predators, as you might expect, are not very common. Usually predators are much rarer than prey. We haven't really talked about the prey animals yet here in the Lake Permian, we're about to. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And I went to go get my backpack. And when I went to go lean down to grab my backpack where my notebook and stuff was, there was another one underneath my backpack. And I was like, oh, and it was a really great day. And these are wonderful specimens. So this is an animal called Dinogorgon. So this is a specimen we collected from Zambia. That's what that looks like today in the prep lab in Seattle. So I hope you can see the eyeball still. And I hope you can see some interesting teeth. That side isn't so pretty. That side's been beat up a little bit. That back of the skull is not very nice. But of course, because we put it in a plaster jacket, you can flip that over. Here's the other side of it. Oh. Isn't that a beaut? <laughs> wow. That's why you should study dinosaurs and fossils sometimes, because you find stuff and you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so look at that saber. This one has a couple of post-canine teeth, a couple incisor teeth. You can see that big nostril. There's the eyeball there. But again, the back of the skull is a little beat up. So this is an animal called Dinogorgon. Obviously, you can see how big it is. There's my fingers. Uh, really fantastic. And so this is one of the larger, not the largest, but one of the larger predators in that ecosystem. There's a nice paleo art reconstruction if you want to know what I really think it looks like. Uh, something like that as a predator walking around. These are fun animals. Uh, because the Idaho Museum of Natural History has a virtualization lab, we do a lot of 3D scanning, a lot of 3D printing, a lot of digital modeling, which is really fun. Some of you maybe saw the skulls exhibit, which isn't up at the museum anymore. We took that down two years ago now. Uh, but the skulls exhibit, right when I started my job at ISU, was right after I found those specimens. And so we digitally crafted those skulls based on the literature and based on the fossils and then 3D printed them. So if you guys want to see one of these animals, you can come down to the museum and there's one on the display. Um, which is so fantastic. There's a lot of diversity, uh, but you can see especially this clade and this animal in particular, Dinogorgon, and then its sister taxon, Rubigia. Those are the names. Look how expanded that temporal fenestra is and all that space for muscle insertion. And then those muscles go through those holes. So like really, you can see bulbous muscles there in the back of the skull for closing those jaws really powerfully. Uh, really fun. And so that's the size of the one that I found uh, in Zambia next to our lab director's actual skull. He had a sinus infection and he asked for it at medical center for the CT of his skull and then he put it in all of our exhibits. So we have a bunch of humans and they're all Jesse's actual skull, which is really fun. Uh, <laughs> but that's how big Jesse is next to a Gorgon, yelling. Okay, so you've seen these guys already, right? Uh, there's fragments of the equatorial parts of the late Permian of uh, Pangaea. And so you saw this during the reptile evolution, Paleozoic reptile evolution lecture. Uh, there are these big therapsid, in this case, Gorgon predators. I don't know how I feel about their shaggy manes by this paleo artist, but I'll allow it because it makes them look pretty fun. 
Um, now you have some context for what these animals are. And again, a price are absolutely getting destroyed <laughs> as in every picture. <laughs> Now, though, we're going to move on to probably actually the most interesting group of therapsids and the most diverse and abundant. That's this one right here. This little dude coming out of a burrow. They're very fun animals. So you guys have met Biermasukians now, Dinocephalians now, Gorgonopsians now. And you can see the next group on the tree called Anomadons. They show up in the beginning of the Middle Permian, just like most of the therapsid lineages show up then, and they continue off the slide. So they live for quite a long time. Unlike these first three groups, anobodonts are quite long lived, geologically speaking, many tens of millions of years. So let's talk about anobodonts. There's how long they go on for. So you can see those next three clades, anobodonts, their civilians, and cynodonts. And again, you are a cynodont, just like you are a therapsid. Cynodonts go on all the way to the present. But anomodons, you can see, make it all the way through this next period of time, the Triassic, which we haven't talked about at all yet. And so very different uh, durations in geologic history for these different clades. And so these next three, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on today and then on Thursday, too. So let's talk about anomodons. Anomodons are so interesting. I'm going to shut up. I'll let you guys look at these for a second. <laughs> make some observations about these anomodons. Even uh, the guys, here are looks like it was really good. Both of the animals that you would guess. Something common, some of the. Oh, we can copy some of the trailer. You would go out there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> 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 So what's jumping out about these? I'm gonna I'm just gonna say weirdos. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm seeing uh, animal has tusks and beak. Tusks and a beak. So we're going to get into the these animals, which are called dicynodonts. I'm going to use that word dicynodont way more than I'm ever going to use the word anomodont. Anomodont's the bigger category that contains the dicynodonts, and then also these guys, <laughs> which are very weird. So dicynodonts absolutely uh, do things that should make you say, what is the deal? Why are these on the mammal side of things? Like when we do museum events and we talk about this one's a kind of reptile and this one's a kind of reptile and this one is a mammal relative and it has beak and tusks and people are like, this one is man. And then paleontologists lose their credibility with certain people because they can't really handle it. Dicynodonts are animals that lose almost all of their teeth, the exception being true ever-growing tusks. And there are animals we're going to see in the Triassic period, later dicynodonts, that absolutely even lose those tusks and have these gigantic beaks that cover them up. But there's many species that have what looks to be an ever-growing tusk, like an elephant has, or like a walrus has, coming out of a beak all around it. Nothing like today has anything like that. So it's very bizarre. It's very weird. It's worthy of study. It's worthy of interest. 
And so that's just dicyanides. That's a clade within this bigger group that loses their teeth. I hope you can see there's plenty of teeth in the early anomodonts. Uh, these animals that are uh, in the middle and late Permian only. Um, Suminia there is one of my favorites. Suminia, we have the whole skeleton for it. It's got very long arms and legs. It's got very long fingers and toes. If you plug its little skeleton into like a database of like modern animal skeletons, like lizards and frogs and mammals that are burrowing or climbing or doing whatever, this animal plots out like it probably is arboreal, like living in trees somewhat, which is not at all what you think for the later members of this group, which are just like basically little sausages. And so this one is interesting. That's one that's from Russia. Fossils are all from Russia for that one. Uh, but it's a really interesting ecology. It makes you really wonder, right? Oh boy, animals and trees don't make very good fossils. So like, what else are we missing if there's an anomena up there clambering around? You can see Patrick Noah on though has teeth. Tierra Udens has a lot of teeth, including like big expanded, labiolingually expanded cheek teeth, malariform teeth. And so it has this big, very obvious, <laughs> savory looking thing. This animal is almost certainly an herbivore though. And so just like some of those dinosaurians, uh, there's not really evidence of it like using that uh, saber in any sort of carnivorous kind of way. So is this again, another kind of display? Mammals and their relatives, and reptiles do it too, do a lot of sexual display with head ornamentation and tooth ornamentation. Uh, really popular examples today are there's several kinds of deer, things like baboons that have really big canines. They show off with them. They're a display structure. They're not necessarily using them in predation. But T.R. Udens was a really surprising fossil when it was first found. This is a fossil from Brazil. And so that skull is almost perfect from one side. And so when that paper came out, everyone's like, okay, because like that is so much longer than you think it should be. But again, what do you do? You find the fossil. So these are some anomodons. Like I said, these dicyanodons are really the most diverse and interesting ones. And they are almost completely herbivorous. So here's a whole lot of dicyanodon diversity. Uh, like I said, they do a lot. I put the in all capital letters there. When you go around and look for fossils and terrestrial ecosystems in the late Permian, which is a pretty important time to do that if you want to understand the end Permian mass extinction, which is the biggest extinction in Earth history, boy, oh boy, oh boy, are you going to find a lot of dicynodonts. You cannot not find the dicynodont fossils. That Gorgon, I was excited because all day we've been finding dicynodonts. So these aren't to scale. Some of them are. But I like this art very much because dicyanodonts are another group that don't really get artistically done very often, especially in a way that's very faithful to, I think, what they might have really looked like. So again, go ahead and talk to your neighbors, make some observations. This is obviously just art, but there's some German scientists putting together a Brazilian skeleton. You get a sense of how big some of these are, uh, but some of them are quite tiny. Uh, go ahead and talk to your neighbors about these animals. These are all dicynodonts. So dicynodonts is a clade within anomodonts. And of course, please read the text if you'd like. But I'll give you a few minutes here to chat about these guys. What questions are coming up for you when you see these things? there's one of you guys of eating skulls we've never seen that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What kind of thing are we talking about? I, I could we could spend a long time on these animals. I'm gonna try to keep it brief. <laughs> but what are you guys picking up on? Uh, slow and clumsy. Slow and clumsy, interesting observations. Uh, I wonder, yeah, that one up in the top right called Lystrosaurus. That one is often referred to as a very it's like a sausage. Uh, it's very robust, long, <laughs> two-wheeler. So yeah, you can imagine things, probably not the fastest animals on the <laughs> landscape. <laughs> what else? Yeah, kind of stubby limbs, shorter limbs. Um, yeah, a lot of them in the later uh, part of the Triassic, especially when they get, they get pretty big, right? Like this one you can see is like a good size, right? Like that's the skull. So the whole animal's like, you know, like as long as this desk and then like the backs up here. So these are not like tiny animals, some of them. And they have they have longer limbs probably because they're larger body size relative to these little ones. Some of them, like that one there, Cystocephalus, you can see doesn't really have tusks. That one is a burrower, like straight up like a mole. It has huge arm muscles and huge arm bones with big expansions on the both ends. And it digs in the dirt. It is like a mole, but it's a dysinum. It's super, super, super cool. Um, I have a slide that, that I could show you that I cut from our uh, labs about appendicular anatomy because we had to condense. And I was going to show you one of these dysynodonts that's absolutely fossorial is the word for it, a burrowing animal, which is really fun. So maybe coming up, up to the roots and the tubers that are underground for some of these plants and like having a little underground colonies. We've got lots of fossils of these guys in burrows, which is really fun. So we know a lot of them dug burrows. Some of them are helical in structure. And you find a fossil of the burrow with like little babies at the bottom or like two adults at the bottom. So interesting social stuff we can infer. Crazy body size of evolution in this clay. This is supposed to be like, that's Robertia, which is the one right there, two down. And that's how big Robertia is on the skull of this one. So some of them are big, especially in the Triassic, you get to be like rhino grading towards small elephant body size. And then there's other ones that the whole animal is like this big. So really fun, really, really interesting organisms. We'll talk more about the tusks and the beak and all that uh, as we keep moving. But I just think these things are really special. I heard Gary saying something about one of them has teeth. So this one, endothiodon, has a beak all around its mouth, but it also has multiple tooth rows. And so it, within dicynodon, there's lots of diversity. Only some of them have true tusks, like tusks that are ever growing like an elephant. Most of them don't, that's interesting. And then ones like endothiodon, have tooth rows inside their jaws. They evolve on their own. They're the only ones that have it. And it gets to be crazy looking. It looks like those capturinids you guys have already met, the reptiles with the rows of teeth. But it's within this bigger group, they just do that. Very interesting, very different. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit more dicynodon stuff because I can't resist. So diectodon is one of these ones that's hilarious. We know way too much about diectodon. There are many, 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 many thousands of diectodon specimens in museum collections because you find them very easily. This is an unbelievable specimen. There's the tusk. Two adults curled up with each other at the end of the burrow that they lived in. So they died when there was a flood and their burrow got filled with mud and there's a big chamber at the end of their burrow and they're both in there together. So these animals were probably living like kind of a prairie doggy life where they have these systems of burrows. It's not very clear how interconnected they were, but certainly like lots of burrows are found in the same place. So you have your burrow and your neighbor's got a burrow. And so sometimes there are juvenile baby dicynodon fossils found in these burrow fossils, which is really fun. So living on that landscape with those big saber-toothed predators running around, there's prey like those priosaurs and some big dicynodons, but there's also these little whack-a-mole moments with... Uh, <laughs> You can imagine the little dicynodonts. Uh, their herbivory is really, really interesting. We'll talk about that. This is an articulate uh, illustration trying to show you the jaw muscles. There's that lateral temporal fenestra that you guys saw in the Gorgon, right? So one big hole, same as your one hole. Here's the cheekbone, same as your cheekbone. And so that jaw muscle comes down. But a lot of dicynodonts do this thing where they have skull bones back here that flare out. And then they have jaw muscles that come in from the side and they can really move their jaws in lots of interesting ways to chew food in ways that other animals have never done anything like that since. 
And so this is a Triassic one. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, they survived the Permian mass extinction, but almost all the ones that survived, and we're going to talk about this much more on Thursday, the patterns of survival in this extinction, are smaller ones. And preferentially, it might be burrowing ones living through the extinction. Whereas a lot of the ones that are out on the landscape, and especially the larger ones, and like I said, big herbivores, all seem to go extinct. And what's cool is from the ones that are burrowing and survive, what we think the pattern is, in the Triassic, they re-radiate. And then you get more big ones, but of a completely different family within Dicynodonts than the original Permian ones that get taken out by the extinction, which is really cool. So this is one of the Triassic forms. We'll meet it again a little bit later. The other thing I can't not say about Dicynodonts is this animal, Lystrosaurus, is like one of the only other, besides maybe Dimetrodon and like Gorgons generally and Moss Chops and Toy Sets, Lystrosaurus is maybe the only other really famous uh, non-mammalian therapsid. So this is that one that looks like a sausage. When you go to places like South Africa that have a really excellent fossil record and you're looking in the immediate aftermath of the mass extinction, Lystrosaurus is like 90% of the fossils you find. Lystrosaurus is hyper abundant. This is an animal that like is everywhere after the mass extinction. So it does well in the extinction aftermath. It lives beforehand too. And we'll talk about that on Thursday. It's a really amazing study organism. You guys maybe know Lystrosaurus. This is a figure from a paper from the 1970s when the idea of continental drift and plate tectonics is finally being like solidified and everyone's accepting it. One of the pieces of evidence people use to argue that all the southern continents used to be touching each other is the distribution of fossils across those continents. How come I can find the same plants in Australia, Antarctica, India, Africa, and South America? Well, what if they were all together? And Lystrosaurus was one of those animals. And so in this paper from 1970, you can read these paleontologists being like, this little sausage dude isn't crossing oceans. And you can find its fossils all over Africa. You can find its fossils in India. You can find its fossils in Antarctica. So that's one of the organisms back in the 70s that was used to kind of put the nail in the coffin on the idea that continental drift is real and the continents move around, which is really fun. So of course, these are Pinchian animals, right, back then. I thought I would just show you another little piece of the research I do. Um, so what you guys are looking at here is a satellite photo of outcrops. In, well, actually, it's just a satellite photo, I should say. This is just a satellite photo of Zambia. So a place in the country of Zambia and Africa where we have these rocks preserved in succession. I hope you can see that there's layers of rock on the satellites. You can see like it looks like the forest is almost in bands. Do you see like the darker green? That's because those rocks are continuing. There's Permian rocks here and there's Triassic rocks here. And there's a paper I'm working on right now that's dividing up the Permian rocks, which we formerly considered to be one big packet of rock that preserves a big Permian ecosystem. We've gone back enough times and kind of walked in straight lines and picked up enough fossils, sampled the ground, that we actually think there's multiple different time distinguished uh, faunas kind of in order. And so down here is older and up there is younger. So if you walk in what is this case, you can see north is that way. So if you walk like west, northwest, you're kind of going up in time which is really cool. That's in a testable hypothesis, right? Then you go look for fossils. That awesome Gorgon I just showed you is from like here. So way up high near the end of the Permian rocks in Zambia. I'm showing you this because I've labeled some of the animals that we've found in these rocks uh, and they're almost all dicynodonts. The fact that dicynodonts are so abundant and so different from one another means we can use them as like biostratigraphy. You guys remember you can use those fossils um, that are common and live for a relatively short time to correlate rocks. And so we think that dicynodonts are really helpful indicators of ecosystem turnover. So I'll just show you a couple cool ones. Here's one called Odinodon, and another one called the Gaikia, uh, the Gaikia, that's a family of really ornamented dicynodonts. And so these big old eyeballs, big nostril, this one's got this ornamentation on its face. And that's probably this lower horizon. And then this upper horizon has all these really interesting guys. Deptocephalus has big old tusks. Compsodon doesn't have very big tusks at all. Really fun, very different kinds of animals. And so dicynodonts really help us understand the rocks to get us set up to like study the dynamics of the extinction, who's going extinct when, what might be causing the extinction to start amongst terrestrial ecosystems. Really fun. Dicynodonts are definitely the animals that like help us get there. I don't want to put you on the spot, Henry, but do you feel like you might want to say a thing about dicynodonts? So Henry's doing his master's work on these ornamented guys. I just showed you that skull. One of these guy kids. So there it is, munching some plants way up there. 
But I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you like to tell us about guide kids for a second? No worries. So um so the subject, so the subject of my master's thesis is the collection of guide kids skulls from late Permian Zambia. As you can see, they um even though that figure is not scale, they range in size, they range in size from the sort of the little skull, or about the size of the paw of you know walk your hand to that massive to that massive skull we just looked at, as well as that. See that chunk of snout that's just oh, below, yeah. that's just below it? Yeah, that guy would have wait. This one, this one is great. So yeah, uh, that is a when, that is a singular chunk of snout from a skull that probably would have been like this wide and light. When we when we found this one, um, we all were passing it around, and so these are these giant like bumps over the nostrils. Sorry, Henry, real quick. And these are the two nostrils, and like just holding it sitting around the campfire, we're all like you can like hear it like like snorting like that is such a great specimen sorry and there's the beat go ahead <laughs> yep. and so and so as you can see a lot of these guys uh, preserve a lot of the detailed bones and since we got and since we got multiple individuals ranging across a series of sizes i think that is probably an ontogenetic sequence ranging from little juveniles to these sort of really big robust adults and especially among the adults you can see some of them have wider some of them some of them have wider skulls some of them have narrower skulls some of them have larger Bumps over the nose, some of them smaller bumps over the nose. So that could be sexual dimorphism, which has been suggested in some of its close relatives from South Africa, where we have large sample sizes and been able to do the statistical tests for it. So I think this might be another example of that. Pretty great. Pretty great. This one's also a, a, a gem. This was a boulder. We were crossing a river, and this was just like one of the rocks in the river. You pick it up, and like this is the lower beak. There's the eyeball, there's the nostril, there's the tusk, there's the front beam. And our or one of our guides is just like, is this one? We're like, put it in the bag, we'll take it. It's one of the great. things about these guys is that it's, uh, yep. And so if you look at and so if you look at those tusks, really complete the a few specimens, the tusks are really complete, and you see this big wear fast on the front of the tusk, which suggest which suggests that uh yeah, along there, yep, along there, which suggests that they were probably using these things for some for, for some sort of a of for, for some sort of work, uh, possibly like rooting in the rooting in a soil or dirt like you take a war is doing today. It's really fun. I didn't include it here because it's silly and unnecessary, but we have a picture of a dicynodon skull that's a really nice one that we found upside down with like the tusk sticking up. And one of the guys from South Africa that was with us, he had like found a warthog skull, like just like a normal warthog that's just dead. And he had the skull. He was like, oh, look, look, look. And you just put them next to each other. They're like the same size. And they both have these big tusks. They both live in the same spot. Fun. Okay. So you guys have already seen this slide, right? Here's Permian for the most part, Amnio for the most part, herbivory. Pelicosaurs, Capturinids, Pariasaurs, and well, I should say, sorry, Caesiosaurs, Adaphosaurs, and Diadectids in the early Permian, Pariasaurs and Capturinids in the middle and late Permian. And now we can add these two, Dicynodonts and Tapanocephalids. So here's some more amnio experimenting. So chat with each other about the patterns we already knew and how these all might fit in or might not fit in. Go ahead. Very interesting how the blood lineage sort of reduced teeth is the one that absolutely dominated um, late Permian and early mid Jurassic existence. Uh, again, that's not that's not actual in some of the calories. Everything that we find is like two species of that kind of everything on the right over snaps in the sea. In the seven seven, but they want like the pariah sword, or the dactyl, I think that's the one. But like tons and tons of little like batteries, so there would be quite a difference. Right. But maybe a boss that has to go and snaps them with their teeth. They're all down, but it's very interesting. And then capinocephalid is apparently seen with much reduced cranium relative to their body size, but not until this test. I just want to know. Well, in terms of all the terms of the SF, freezing it. In terms of speed, well, that would just be there are over 100 feet of that. I don't think that would work. So far, there are many, 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 many
So what are, what are these two therapsids at, right? Because these are both these are both synapsids. These are reptiles. That's probably outside of amniota. They're all living together. These are also synapsids, but they're therapsids. These two, what are they adding to the story that you guys already kind of put together? Unlike all these other guys, you source the you source the uh, at least at least index ion reduction of teeth instead of elaboration upon yeah. tooth shape complexity to count. So what's something that cyanodons look like they might be doing that is like obviously different? So like yeah, they don't have teeth for sure. So what else what's another thing that's going on with them then? They're not they got the beak food. for sure. Yeah. They're not chewing their food, but they have to be doing the perfect thing. So they don't have particularly capacious guts. I wouldn't call them like like I would for some people on this slide. So they don't have teeth. I didn't talk about it, but they have these like big pads on their bones of their lower jaw and on the roof of their mouth that are probably, we say, cornified. I don't think we really know what's on them exactly. What they do have though, huge jaw muscles and an extremely flexible lower jaw. The way that that articular in that quadrate those same bones that a reptile has articulating its jaw, their middle ear bones and you. But for these animals, that jaw joint is super flexible. So the cyanides can go like this with their jaws. They can do all kinds of crazy movement. They're probably chewing like crazy, but they don't have any teeth. So deal with it. And what about these guys? I would throw them in the camp for sure. <laughs> Huge guts and really cool teeth, really interesting cropping teeth, occluding teeth, right? You saw they're big incisors, but they're not probably chewing with them very much. So definitely an interesting way to take in the food. And then, yeah, these probably fermenting guts. So again, body size and processing food. I like this slide very much because you guys can really think about this. Nipping the plants, processing the plants orally, processing the plants later in your digestion, somewhere in soft tissue land, your stomach, your intestines, something maybe in front of your stomach, a lot of animals have today. These are really interesting and different strategies. Gigantic head, not so gigantic head, huge individual teeth, no teeth, a lot of tiny teeth, interlocking teeth. They're just doing all kinds of different things. And to me, that's very fun and very amazing. Okay, thank you. Now let's talk about the next two groups. So you can see, by the way, just to make clear, right? Only some of these are herbivores and only the later ones of these are herbivores. So we're still defaulting in our reconstruction almost certainly to like carnivory throughout this part of the tree, which is really fun. So that next group up is called Pharisophalians, the beast heads. These are our closest relatives, meaning Cynodon's closest relatives. There's Phelan and Cynodon's our sister. I'm not giving you the name for that clay, but they are sister. Uh, so they are pretty mammaly. They're getting mammaly. Cynodon's are going to get even more mammaly. Um, again, we're not going to talk about them today, just a second. They survive the end Permian mass extinction. They show up in the middle Permian, just like the rest of the therapsid. They survive the end Permian mass extinction. They make it into the Triassic for a little bit, and we're going to talk about it later. But some of the last Therisphalians are herbivores. They try it and they do something different than you've seen already. I wish you guys talked to each other, make some observations real quick, just about these guys. They're very fun. Specimens like this make me want to scream because that's just so beautiful. But okay, go ahead. Oh, yeah, just skull, superficial skull are reminiscent of
So something that I think is really fun about these guys, these are getting, uh, so, so you guys are learning, I told you on Thursday, there's a lot of trends we can kind of pick up on throughout synapsid evolution broadly through the pelicosaurs, the therapsids, the cyanodonts into mammals, big trends. And one of them is those middle ear bones and that lower jaw. You guys only have a dentary. Look how big the dentary is in this stairs of failure. And then these are all those jaw bones that are not the dentary. That one's the uh, articular. That's the one that's holding your eardrum right now. Look how big it is here on this there's failure. It's kind of ornamented. It's really interesting. So it's like sticking out right there. That's kind of your eerie structure, but it, for this animal, it's like this. Fun. Big denary though, big denary. They're kind of fun. You get more post caniniform teeth than a goriopsis. Uh, sure, sure. Most more teeth past the big old canine tooth. I, I think that's probably right. Some of them don't have any. Again, they're swallowers. Uh, there's one animal called Therignathus. I don't think I have it here. It has basically like a boomerang. If you find the lower jaw, the whole jaw looks like a boomerang with two teeth up front. <laughs> it's gross, but also very fun. This one's called Euchambersia. It's been controversial for a long time. It's got a big excavation in the side of its face, like a huge dent. And people don't know if that's like a scent marking gland. Do these animals have a good sense of smell? Some people have suggested it's venomous because there's a groove on the back of the uh, canine tooth. So not like a snake that has like a hypodermic needle for a tooth, like a rattlesnake has a tooth that goes through a hole, sorry, that goes through the tooth almost to the tip. Whereas this is like a groove on the back of the tooth. I'm not so sure, I don't know. There's a couple animals in this guy's family, which are really fun. Uh, yeah, I don't want to tell you, <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Um, here are some really interesting therosophilians that survive into the Triassic. So we're going to talk about these, like I said, again on Thursday when we talk about the extinction. Um, but something I'll give you guys a little tease with. Most of the therosophilians in the Triassic are this big. There's eyeball, nose. This is a big therosophilian predator from the Permian. We'll talk about what this one is on uh, Thursday. But so once we get into the Triassic, for a period of time, some of these Therosophilians are the bigger herbivores because Gorgonopsians go extinct at the boundary. Therosophilians do not go extinct. And so there's a couple different Therosophilians there, Moscorhinus, Tetracynodon. We've traded up Bryosaurus for Dicynodons as our ever being murdered prey animals. Uh, but these are really interesting, fun guys. We're gonna talk about them, like I said, a lot more on Thursday than we will right now. But we're like, I'm not sure about the hairiness in this picture. I don't totally love it. Something that's, mm, I'll tell you that in a second, actually. We'll talk about these guys more on Thursday. I just wanted you to see them. They're very weird, very fun. All right, so the last group of therapsids we have to meet are our group, cynodonts. You guys, like I've said the five times now, are cynodonts. I'm going to give you three synapomorphies for cynodontia, just like I gave you four for therapsida, because these are all synapomorphies that actually pertain to you and your anatomy. So cynodonts have an additional obvious insertion for jaw muscles. Doesn't mean these jaw muscles are brand new just to them, but the muscles are obviously getting bigger and they're being housed on the bones. And that's a masseteric fossa. On the fossils, all we can see, of course, are the bones. You have a temporalis muscle to close your jaw right here that attaches onto your skull and goes down to your lower jaw. That's a synapsity thing. The masseter is a muscle that attaches out here on your cheekbone and your zygoma, goes down to your back of your dentary, and you have a depression on your dentary called a fossa. That's what a fossa is, is a depression. And the masseteric fossa is where that master muscle inserts, originating on your cheekbone, inserting on your lower jaw. In an animal like a cynonaut, you can see this depression on this outside part of the lower jaw. So you have your temporal muscles to close the jaw, but now you have this masseteric fossa for also closing the jaw. It's another powerful set of muscles. And masseteric muscles can really be very interesting in a lot of animals that involve interesting ecologies for moving the jaw around, especially like a little bit side to side. So that masseteric fossa shows up in cynodonts. All cynodonts have a masseteric fossa. So if you find a loose jaw in the Permian, is it a gorgon, is it a therosophilian, is it a cynodont? You can tell if it's a cynodont. So it'll have that fossa on the outside of the dentary. There it is. Another thing, oh, there's a kitty cat. And so on that cat lower jaw, all dentary, 
you can see this nice depression right here. And that's where those mass, that master vessel inserts on that cat's lower jaw. And cymodonts have that same thing. Another character is that we start to get cusps on the post canine teeth. Some of the gorgons and some of their civilians have teeth, sorry, yeah, teeth behind their canines, but they're usually kind of just pointy, sharp teeth. In cynodonts, we start to get, you can see these cusps, little bits of anatomy that stick up beside that main thrust of the tooth. That allows their teeth to do more interesting things. So there's cusps on those teeth. When we get into mammals, you guys are going to see that those cusps and all the ridiculous amount of minutia of details about tooth cusps, that's like how mammal taxonomy works. These are all lower jaws from different primates. And you could show anybody who studies these animals one single tooth, and they'll tell you what species it is, because mammals go so specialized in their teeth. And so these cusps start showing up in simple ways in cynodonts. And today, mammals inherit those really cuspy teeth. The last character I'll give you that's a sign out character, Bapurba, is from uh, lab. You've already seen it. A division of the dorsal part of your vertebral column, the dorsal vertebrae, into thoracic and lumbar regions. So in lab, you guys learned only mammals today have thoracic and lumbar, but it's not only mammals in Earth history. Sign it on to the ones that evolved this. Probably it has something to do with how they breathe. Your diaphragm. Muscular uh, division in your abdominal cavity that like actually works to pump your lungs correlates with the edge of your ribs. And so these animals have that same kind of division. Here's a skeleton, two skeletons of two little cynodonts, just like dicynodonts. These little cynodonts were found together in a burrow. So they're curled up together. They got buried, sadly, alive in their home. <laughs> But you can see here, big old ribs, and then it stops, and then here's the rest of their dorsal vertebrae. So these are the lumbar, and these are the thoracic regions. So there's that animal, it's called Thridaxodon. It lives in the early part of the Triassic. And there's a dire wolf, a nice ice age mammal that no one's gonna think isn't a mammal. And they both have thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae, which is really fun. And of course you guys do too, you're using them right now. So those are the three characters I think you should have for Cynodontia. Let's talk a little bit about Permian Cynodonts. Let you guys look at these for a minute, make some observations. So I hope I'm trying to be, I'll be a little bit aware of the time. I hope you guys are noticing that we're getting pretty mammally now, but some stuff's a little bit off. Um, cynodonts might be the place where we start to put hair, although I personally don't think you get hair until even later in cynodont evolution. These are all Permian cynodonts I'm showing you right now. I would be surprised if any of these had fur, but here's the problem. There's one fossil hoop, a coprolite, what you call a fossilized species, that exists in the Permian, and it's from Russia. And if you cut it up, and people have cut it up, it looks like there's a kind of hair in the poop which it might not be hair, but it also totally might be hair. And if it's hair, that's really frustrating. We're like, well, then who is hairy? Because it's not clear who should be hairy at this point. If it's somebody, I'm most comfortable with cynodonts <laughs> being the things that are hairy. I heard some of you saying that you're uncomfortable with how this looks. Most of the cynodonts are in that kind of uncanny valley, animals that people are very undispleased to lay their eyes upon because it's like too close to being a mammal while still being something else. Dicynodonts are weird enough and gorgons are cool enough that you don't notice, but cynodonts are like, what? Like a hairless chihuahua thing with no ears and all these other stuff in a tail, a little bit upsetting. Um, but in the Permian, there's plenty of cynodonts. For the most part, they're predators. We don't think they're doing anything else really ecologically, and they never get too big. Their skull sizes are always in this range. That one for Sinusuchus is fun because it might be semi-aquatic. It has a lot of adaptations that we think it was could have been swimming a little bit, which is pretty fun to imagine, you know, in like the river or the lake 
where Sinusuchus jumping in. Obviously, these animals are going to be really important to us going forward in the Triassic, which we'll talk about later. They evolve into mammals. So mammals come from these guys, which is really important. Um, another thing I'll talk about really quick is that these animals are really known burrowers. So you've already seen this specimen of Thrinaxodon, two individuals in the burrow chambers, the end of their burrow, they got buried together. Interesting, we can talk about sociality, maybe things like parental care, we find babies in the burrows. One thing that's very, very fun is that these burrows are always dug up when they're found, because you can see like, it might be empty, but if you scan it with a CT scanner, there might be something inside. This is one of the most famous of these fossils. Here's a Thrinaxodon smashed up against the inside of its burrow. That's a real, probably the animal who dug the burrow. And in the burrow with it is a Temnophon. So one of those amphibians you guys have already met. And so that's obviously very cute and very fun. If you guys know anything about burrowing animals today, there's like famously in Florida, gopher tortoises will dig burrows. So that's obviously a tortoise, a turtle digs a burrow, but like rabbits use the burrow and rattlesnakes use the burrow. Everybody uses the burrow once you build it. In Africa, like an aardvark digs a burrow, but everybody, a warthog will use it, a meerkat will use it. Everybody uses a burrow once it exists. And so this is probably an example of like this tempest model like just like coming in. <laughs> And just living with that sign on, the sign on doesn't care, which is really fun. It's inspired lots of very funny art about them being in love or something else. But uh, <laughs> that's very cool, right? This burrowing has a lot of implications that are pretty intense. And you guys can start thinking about the mammalian condition and how mammals seem to be pretty different from other terrestrial vertebrates. Resting, taking a long time to raise your young, but you're doing it in like a safe space a place that's relatively protected. Is this something that helps some of the cynodonts, usually smaller ones, and they almost all are small for me, and survive the mass extinction? So some of the parareptiles are burrowing, some of the dicynodonts are burrowing, maybe some of the therospelians are burrowing, definitely some of the cynodonts are burrowing. A lot of those animals we see survive the mass extinction, which is really interesting. You can imagine how, we're gonna talk about the extinction on Thursday, this event that's very chaotic and unstable, if you have a place that's thermally insulated and like you're relatively safe, it could be something that is a big proponent to your survival. It's very cool. Uh, this is the last thing I'll show you today before we go. Uh, I'm just very happy with this. This is a mural I commissioned that hasn't been published yet, um, but this is that ecosystem in Zambia. You guys have been, I've been yelling out at you for a while now. And so we've got our burrowing dicynodonts, our therosophilians, our little cynodonts running through the water, more interesting therosophilians, some more dicynodonts, a big old pariasaur, who's not the victim today. That was my choice. Here's one of those Mirazukians with the weird cranial morphology. And then here's our big Gorgon going after some other dicynodonts, which is really fun. I just think these are the ecosystems that are fun to put yourself in, because once you go into the Triassic, you start to get reptile world going on, a lot of dinosaurs and cracks and things like that show up. And so it's fun to imagine that for a time, before dinosaurs, before reptiles really have ecological dominance, it's the therapsids, it's the mammal line animals that are the big herbivores, the big predators on land. A lot of people don't think about that in Earth history. Um, and there's this really fun window where that is the case. But anyway, I will see you guys on Thursday where we'll talk about the extinction itself. Okay.